So today for the keynote address, we have a very eminent personality with us, Professor Sir Lesik Boris Witch. Sir Boris is the Chair of Cancer Research UK and former Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge. He also served as the Chief Executive of the UK's Medical Research Council and as Deputy Director of Imperial College London. He was founding fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences too. Sir Boris has had a very illustrious and distinguished academic and clinical research career. His research contribution includes Europe's first trial of a therapeutic vaccine for HPV to treat cervical cancer. Sir Boris was knighted in 2001 for his contribution to medical education and research into developing vaccines. It's a great honor and privilege to have you, Sir Boris, with us to address the keynote today. So I welcome Dr. Sabordis, to address the keynote. Well, good morning. And firstly, may I just offer my congratulations to the India Alliance on their 10th birthday. You've really broken new ground, and particularly being able to see the huge quality and the amazing number of over 300 fellows who've benefited uh, from uh, the uh, work that you, you have been doing. Um, and what I'd like to do is to cover the potential direction in which engagement, particularly with Cancer Research UK, and the way we actually see the directions that life sciences are going to take uh, cancer uh, research in the future. Well, thank you. Uh, so, uh, take two. Um, right, what I'm going to do is to uh, start with the health warning in relationship to this talk. Basically, Current improvements in cancer care are, are, as far as I'm concerned, the result and consequences of 40 years or more investment in basic life science research. We would be nowhere in cancer research without that absolutely important fundamental commitment. Secondly, the future is totally unpredictable, but there are signposts as to where we will be taking cancer research and cancer care over the next 12 to 15 years. The health warning comes that this is a completely eclectic collection, which uh, now as a chairman rather than chief executive, I'm able to do. And that's to pick my seven or eight key publications that I have seen in 2018 that I see as signposts for the way forward. You also know the chairman do not set the strategies for organizations, but they are actually there um, only to make sure the governance and everything else is working properly. But needless to say, at least I hope that these will stimulate some debate and discussion. So I may be well wide of the mark, but this is at least a personal view as to where I think the direction will come in uh, in the future. So firstly, the question is, how far is behavior and variation that we observe a consequence of intrinsic change in the cancer cell. Uh, so far, we have taken a perspective that, as far as I'm concerned, cancer is a somatic cell genomic disease. And wherever the anatomical location of that disease, it may have a bearing on how we manage uh, cancer, but at the end of the day, the fundamental process is reasonably well understood at the present time. The question is, is how much of that is intrinsic to the cancer cell and how much is it from the environment the cancer cell finds itself in? And this series of studies from Hans Claver's lab, I think are really very, very important and an important signpost. The experiment that he's conducted is actually very simple in its uh, construction. And that is to say, let us take a colonic polyp, which we know from the Vogelstein model is probably the result of a clonal aberration that occurs at a single part of the epithelium in the colon. And therefore, if you like, the polyp that arises is actually something that comes from a single cell at one point. By the time we see the polyp, that has already moved on. And the question was, if you take subclones of a single polyp, how do those subclones behave and how much variation has happened from that very first single change. And if you place that in culture, because we now have the culture conditions to be able to maintain it for a few divisions, what do we actually see that if you remove it out of the, the environment of the body, how does that clone behave? 
And the bottom line is, this is where the complexity starts, because the answer is very, very differently from subclones of the same polyp. And here's just to give you an example from that particular publication. This is the uh, clones from the same tumor show massive variation in the acquisition of mutations. So subclone 1, which is shown basically as P1 tumor, uh, has around 75,000 mutations occurring in about five cycles of cell division. Very different to the one that is identified as P3 tumor from a different subclone. And what you're seeing there is a much lower rate of mutation, but new signature mutations are rising more frequently compared with the more stable mutations you're tending to see. And this does not just mean point mutations. It actually means in translocations, in uh, uh, inversions, deletions, and everything else that is actually going on. So once you have the polyp, every one of those subclones is exploding in its own direction. And that has two very important messages. We always thought that gene silencing was going to be very dependent on the environment the cell finds itself in. The simple result of that study suggests that the gene silencing is also a random event that occurs in the cancer cell removed from its normal environment. And secondly, and possibly more important therapeutically, is that every subclone demonstrates every form of resistance to therapy such that the conclusion has to be you could not hit the patient w with any form of chemotherapy, which is going to be absolutely clearing all of the potential uh, malignant cells. And this takes you down a line of beginning to think of cancer more as we think of HIV, that as resistance develops to one, you might predict what the uh, combination chemotherapy is going to have to be in the future, but you're not looking at complete eradication because, frankly, the combination you'd have to use would kill the patient. You have to look to the possibility that you will have to have multiple cycles uh, as each recurrence uh, uh, occurs in that individual. And that needs a mindset change in cure to care to long-term management of cancer moving, firstly, for cure wherever we can to get there faster, but if we can't, the second stage of the conversion of cancer from a major catastrophic diagnosis to a chronic disease is actually something we can genuinely aspire to. So if mutation rates and complexities and gene silencing are so complex, can science ever convert this to an effective diagnosis and application to clinical practice? And I'm going to give this a qualified yes and say particularly that we will get there as a result of a number of studies that Cancer Research UK uh, initiated in the Tracer X uh, period. And these studies have tried to track recurrence and preclinical diagnosis. A very complex slide, but it's only there to uh, remind me that this goes to the studies of Abosch et al. Uh, in nature, and what you can look at here is a very simple um, observation. And that is, if we can find a driver mutation, can we begin to track that mutation in a particular patient? And can circulating tumor DNA actually predict the outcome long before you see radiological change? This could have big connotations in clinical practice because it might mean we will not be using radiology to follow up patients, but initiating treatment based on uh, circulating tumor DNA. That little graph in the corner shows you that at the moment, the amount of circulating tumor DNA is actually dependent very much on the radiological load of tumor that's actually visible. There is a direct correlation between it. So the bottom line of these studies suggests that circulating DNA can predict recurrence, but it's at the limit of resolution, um, uh, and it's just about comparable to CT. The difference is if you look at a CT of the nodules of somebody who's been a smoker, you can't predict which of those nodules might actually be malignant and will actually grow in the future, whereas a circulating tumor DNA can begin to draw that prediction. And so 
we have technology to still fall back on. We're still a log order below the sensitivity of where circulating tumor DNA can really uh, work effectively diagnostically, but it is something that uh, could be very useful, particularly in determining recurrence, even though it is still some way away from being able to predict primary tumors before we can actually see them. So if detection of mutations can help tr track tumor recurrence, and the technology will improve, uh, it could, could it replace imaging? I think that's a, a reasonable question to ask. Could it provide added value? For instance, the nature of that tumor DNA, could it predict what the resistance is likely to be and therefore help you as an oncologist actually define what we should be doing in terms of tumor? So if it's helpful in the individual patient, can we draw conclusions to the benefit of wider numbers? And here I turn to the papers in cell for the two uh, cell genome atlas studies coming from the United States. If you analyze 10,000 tumor samples uh, genomically for 33 cancer types, and you use, in essence, they claim they're using 26 different software tools to analyze uh, that data, without going into the detail, you can see you end up with 299 genes that appear to be very common driver mutations across the whole spectrum of tumors. Now that in itself is quite an interesting uh, reduction process in what's going on at individual cancers. But it has one other connotation. And in that study, they showed that 57% of sequenced tumors have the potential for treatment that is actionable oncogenic events that are occurring. And it's the lower graph I want you to, to look at in particular, that these 50, that if you can detect a signature mutation, already 57% of those mutations have a drug in either in active trial or already approved by the FDA. So what we're looking at here is a wholesale change in the way in which our oncology clinics are going to be potentially managed and what they're going to be looking at in the future. So we're going to have less interest in whether this is a renal cancer or a brain cancer or an ovarian cancer, but increasingly looking to those molecular signatures to define how we're going to approach both the chemotherapeutic, the radiotherapy, and even defining whether surgery is necessary or should it be performed. And the questions that help define that is whether the mutations that we see in an individual patient, we're now moving away from grouped patients right down to precision medicine to the individual patient. The Tracer X studies for renal cancers begin to show how this is possible. We've known for some time the clear cell cancer of the kidney has this unusual potential that it's sometimes worth taking out solitary metastases in some patients with complete recovery of the patient. The question was, does this have a molecular basis? And the studies that were conducted actually published in three consecutive papers in cell the week after the tumor uh, genome atlas show that in essence, in the far left-hand end of this slide, the primary mutation probably occurs about 20 years in a little group of two or three tubular cells in the kidney. And in many, probably that's it. But sometimes that will progress in the characteristic Vogelstein model. That progression is defined in two areas. It's not the primary driver mutation, it's the further driver, the secondary mutations, that will define the behavior of that tumor. So in the upper group that you find the BAP1s, the VHLs, and uh, other clonal drivers like the RAP1 mutations, you will have rapidly progressive disease. And in those patients, you actually have to uh, be clear that it may not even be worth taking out the primary tumor, but you need to start systemic treatment. But in the second group, you actually have a very benign form of disease where quite radical approaches, even to metastatic disease, can be curative. 
and certain metastases can lie around for 20 plus years without causing the patient trouble, all defined by the driver mutations that you're actually finding. So again, the molecular signatures are beginning to point us to a different approach as to how we're going to manage cancer. So what about metastases? What's the paper that has really caught my attention in relationship to metastases? How much variation occurs at the metastatic site? Now, the data from the first series of papers from Clavers tends to suggest that, in reality, the greatest variation occurs at the site of the primary, not at the site of the metastasis. And for me, that's really great news, because it does mean the metastatic disease is open to uh, a relatively aggressive treatment in the future. And writers work in science, and this is from Novak's group, addressed a very important question. And they addressed this in 20 cancer patients with 115 samples and 76 untreated metastases. The problem with this sort of study, you need to catch the metastases, they're untreated. And they ask which of these models actually uh, applies to metastases. Is there a dominant clone within the primary tumor that, that seeds all metastases? Or is it a subclone that seeds metastases? Or a subclone that treats some metastases? Well, the bottom line, and I can't go into the details, is that in most tumors, that is the dominant model. Only in rapidly growing tumors, slowly growing tumors, do you begin to see the second two mathematical uh, structures uh, that arise. And that means that you do need to be able to monitor the whole of that uh, tumor if you're going to try to predict where the metastases occur. But it does also point to the fact that most metastases carry a, signal signi a single signature. So can this lead to new modalities of treatment? Well, you could have hours spending on immunotherapy. This is the immunophenome. Do not run away that immunotherapy is going to be the answer for everything. It isn't. It's got huge variation. And these are the problems rather than the success stories we hear about. Many tumors lose HLA, and therefore both CAR-T and other tr treatments are not going to be of particular value in those patients. There are neoantigens escape pathways. There's promiscuous binding and T-cell responses. You open up autoimmunity, and particularly an encephalomyelitic syndrome that is occurring in some of these patients. And there's also the impact of concurrent therapies. So immunotherapy is still very much in its infancy, and our capacity to define its best use is some way away. So do these advances take us further in the pathway to improve patient care? I think they do. I think mutations can be of value in early diagnosis. That is beginning to be established and will be established for more tumors in the next uh, year or two. Can they predict tumor and metastatic localization? Again, the uh, answer is a guarded positive, that it will be able, we'll be able to predict tumor behavior. Can they predict outcome? Well, at least in the renal case, that is certainly uh, true, but I think we're starting to see that that will be true of other tumors. And can they predict future therapeutic targets? Most definitely, yes. The problem is yes, but proving it and implementing it are actually more difficult than actually establishing the principle. So we have to move to multimodality therapeutics. Cancer is an interesting disorder in that we use surgery, drugs, we use radiotherapy quite frequently in a variety of combinations. If you come in with a new treatment, such as immunotherapy in the green box, we use it at the moment as salvage therapy right at the far end. Now, as an immunologist, I can tell you that is absolutely, completely and utterly cockeyed. If you had to use immunotherapy, it should be the primary modality of treatment before you've shot the immune system to pieces with radiotherapy, surgery, and chemotherapy. And yet, we don't use it there. To just do the trials to determine the optimum positioning of each of these four modalities of treatment and how you sequence those four modalities of treatment is four factorial clinical trials. Just ponder that for a moment. That's before you make a single change in any of the agents you're going to use. 
but each of them cause comorbidity and multimorbidity issues, especially as we have an aging population with cancer. So the scale of the problem, trying to get this in my own, uh, wrap my own head around this, is if you have 50 active chemotherapeutic agents, we all use them in combinations of four, that's 50 to the power four combinations. And AI will tell you from the HIV story, we can't predict which of those combinations is going to be best. Then we have, let's say, about 50 tumors. So there'll be at least four to five anatomical staging procedures. That's 250 to the power four. And if you add molecular markers, X, that's four times X, whatever that may be, and add Y, um, any other variable you want to take into consideration, you come up with a solution that there are not enough patients in the world to do phase three trials for cancer. So is the day of the phase three trial dead? For cancer, I'm going to go and say probably outside of major class agents, it may well be. And we're going to have to adapt to far less active uh, knowledge of what is going to be needed in the future. So this brings forward to the research community some very serious questions. That clinical trials and evaluation methodology research is going to be as important in changing the way in which we can get more value out of every single patient we treat and we engage with than currently, dare I say, the conventional body bag count that we do in a phase three trial. We also have to consider provisional licensing. 13 years from bench discovery to bedside isn't much use to you if you have a glioblastoma with an 18-month prognosis period. Just like HIV patients, you want access to the treatment tomorrow. You know, if I found myself in that unfortunate position, you know what I'd be doing? I'd be ringing up Sigma, getting the basic chemicals, getting my friendly chemist to synthesize whatever it was there and I don't give a damn about what the patents and everything else actually says. So why should I be treated differently to many others in the world that will be facing this problem? But it carries a corollary and probably the most difficult thing, that patients will have to be part of that process and they have to accept greater risk. If this is to happen, they get earlier access, they have to forego the right to sue the company. And that is not going to be that easy as our lawyer community will tell you very quickly, you have no right to give up your right to suit for negligence. Ponder. If you're a neuropathologist, this paper tells you you'll be out of work in a short period of time. What this is, is showing you already the implications of artificial intelligence in the neuropathology community. This study was very simple and straightforward. It basically took just tumor methylation profile from glioblastomas against the WHO criteria identified by pathologists. Now, the reason this was chosen was not because this was uh, having a go at neuropathologists. It's just that the WHO criteria are very well defined uh, in neuropathology. In essence, 60%, there was a complete concordance. But remember, you're only looking at methylation profile. In an additional 15%, there was concordance uh, with just minor uh, subclassification uh, issues. The problem is with the other 25%. Firstly, I'm not surprised, but in reality, in 12% of cases, the computer was right, the pathologist was wrong. And these are good pathologists. But more interestingly, the last 11% told us the classification is all wrong and that in reality there are different ways of ensuring the classification will occur. So will artificial intelligence and machine learning here in pathology, in radiology, robotics in surgery actually change the direction in which we are going? And then the billion, literally billion dollar, trillion dollar question. This is the data from IARC for the number of new cancer cases, the incidence, this is not the prevalence, this is the incidence of new cases of cancer globally. That is the global projection from 2012 to 2035. That, I hope, uh, maybe I'm saying that optimistically in my case, is still within my lifetime. 
What do the numbers mean for India? Now, take these with a big pinch of salt. The UK data is probably pretty rock solid, but this is dependent on cancer registry data. I'm afraid I just do not believe 1.15 million cases of cancer in India a year. China is currently standing at 4.1 million. Unless something miraculous is happening in India, which has a very low incidence, it means underreporting is very, very significant here. But even on that underreporting, the projection is look at the percentages. The percentage increase in incidence in India is going to grow by 65%. So if that number is closer to 3 million, just project up 65% on top of that by 2035. This, for a health minister, is the nightmare to end all nightmares, especially if you add my optimism that we will have more patients with a prevalence of cancer, but living longer with the cancer, but under clinical care. So forget all the issues with diabetes, cardiovascular stroke, and elsewhere, which are huge in their own implications. This is an absolute financial storm that's waiting to hit. And I'm afraid the only solutions are going to be technology, and the use of uh, artificial intelligence to help dissect out what's better. But it also carries something else, that healthcare reform is absolutely to the forefront. Today's systems, whether it's the NHS, or whether it's healthcare in India, or whether it's healthcare in America, or France, or Germany, is just not capable uh, of delivering what will be required in the future. And that, friends, is actually the most difficult thing where science is actually directing us. The science is telling us that we will have to reform the way in which we manage health care for patients with cancer. So, in conclusion, we have to take a global perspective. In Cancer Research UK, we're doing this through global collaboration, and today we'll be signing uh, agreements and arrangements to be able to open up joint working between uh, India and Cancer Research UK in the UK. It's a toe in the water, but it's a message as well that we have to take a global solution to this global problem. So in conclusion, understanding biology of cancer is fundamental to developing intelligence, evidence-based treatments and advances in clinical care. The grand challenges issue is very important. This is about getting collaboration across continents, across countries. No single institution or individual is going to find all the solutions, but international teams and international collaboration can get there. The novel developments will come from a variety of directions. I'm usually challenged because I say more is going to come out of compute, computing physics and engineering than will come out of biology, particularly in the shorter term. How well are our institutions geared to take advantage uh, of that? And how do we develop new approaches to evaluation? Our current systems are arcane, slow, and not fit for purpose with the urgency with which patients uh, require it. We must deal with that as a matter uh, of uh, some speed and alacrity. And how do we ensure that evidence-based prevention and early diagnosis, which we know is the best way to keep that uh, prevalence up high and the incidence as low as possible, how do we actually implement those strategies? I say in the NHS, the NHS is relatively easy because it's a whole nation system, but how do you do it where you've actually got both private and state run systems running in parallel? And how do we support and help the NHS to continue to improve and deliver to patients? I'm a complete believer in state led systems, and that's why I use the terminology NHS. But whatever system you operate, there is no excuse for not doing that. Because at the end of the day, we're all here because of the individual patients who are out there and have those problems and have to face those problems with their family. And my belief and optimism is that science will continue to drive this. The question for all of us, whether we're basic scientists or applied scientists, is how do we ensure that the individual patient can benefit from all that work. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Boris. Thank you, Sir Boris, for a very insightful talk. Now the hall is open for questions.
quite, um, quite revealing and you know, incredible perspective. Um, well, thank you for that. Uh, um, but you did mention that there was a, a certain bottleneck in terms, of, in terms of metastasis that the cancers experience. Now, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Is, the, is it a mechanistic bottleneck in terms of the cellular machinery that contributes towards metastasis, or is it, or, or is it something else that you were thinking about? Uh, I think the, the current evidence, and particularly I, I, there's Novak's paper, there's a whole slew of papers coming around about metastasis. What we can begin to draw as conclusions is, is the amount of variation that occurs in the metastasis itself is much smaller than at the site of primary tumor. It also looks that the seeding is occurring probably quite early in the evolution of cancer. And so we have two questions now. What makes particular metastases dormant? There's a, a lovely example in the Tracer X studies uh, on, on renal, which show that the very rare pancreatic metastasis occurs very early in that tumor, but will lie dormant for 20 years. And it's a particular driver that takes it to the pancreas. We don't know whether it's the driver that initiates the slowness with which that recovers or whether it's the environment in which it finds itself. And I think, to me, that's the billion-dollar question with metastasis. The optimism is, because of the lower rate of mutation intrinsic in the metastasis, there are some serious questions that will now have to be asked. Should you take out the primary tumor even in metastatic disease if that's what's happening? Because you might get, as Novak is suggesting, you might get subsidiary clones uh, developing, which again will show new metastatic seeding. So that's a very important question. And if you just extrapolate from that, the burden you now throw on surgery is, is quite enormous. Then you've got the whole question of the anatomical location of metastasis. So it's not just that dealing with the underlying mutations and change, it is actually dealing with the physical location of the metastasis. If you happen to have it close to the spinal cord, of course, you've got to deal with the physical, physicality of the metastasis as well. So that's why I think we're in a very interesting area. What makes for dormancy in metastasis? What makes uh, metastases respond? And we've all seen that in, in the clinic where some will respond, some will not respond. How do we actually vary the, the treatments and the resistance that we actually map from metastasis? And can we predict that from the mutations that we're seeing at the primary? Uh, all of those, I think, are going to be mapped out in the next four to five years. And in particular, there is a, a grand challenge that we're trying to hold as to what causes the dormancy question. Um, if we could, for example, convert metastasis from active to dormant, you know, that may help many people live an absolutely normal life. But it's the reason for my optimism in genuinely believing we can move cancer into a completely different place from the devastating diagnosis it is today. Hello. Uh, at least from the probabilistic point of view, don't you think that uh, the cells which are already metastatic, uh, which has undergone metastasis, might uh, undergo a lot of uh, changes? Uh, rather than the uh, the original tumor, yeah. So it is it's really surprising uh, w uh, what you have right now told. And still, what could be the mechanism? That's what we don't know. I don't know what the mechanism is likely to be. And the questions posed in that science paper in relationship to it, to what restricts it. It may well be the very nature of the cell that seeds. So in other words, it's seeded earlier when there are fewer driver mutations uh, at the time it was first seeded. But also its control may actually be external and more from the stroma and the environment in which the, uh, the, the metastatic cell actually finds itself. So I think that's where you, you've got a very serious set of a lot of research that will still need to be done to define those criteria and therefore whether we can change that into new therapeutic modalities as a consequence of that work. I, to me, it's probably the most exciting area of cancer research at the moment. Really unbelievable. So, Boris, yeah. here. Uh, thank you for a very informative talk. Uh, what is the status of liquid biopsies in clinical diagnosis and, and and what are the pitfalls? Uh, 
So liquid by liquid uh, biopsies, we can look at a variety of areas. In, in my world, previously, it was cervical cancer, and therefore looking for viral genes was uh, what we see as liquid biopsies. But most people refer to it as circulating tumor DNA, the capacity to look either for tumor cells or for signatures uh, in the area. From my point of view, we need technological advance still to improve the sensitivity. But it comes with a particular health warning. Um, I did this so long ago. Can I ask anybody over the age of 60 to please put up their hand? <laughs> okay, good. Very nice young population here. Those of us over the age of 60, work published this week, show that 50% of our cells in the esophagus already carry one driver mutation. The miracle is that we don't all end up with esophageal cancer. It's the, the question turned around the other way but it has a real connotation to liquid biopsy. If once we improve the sensitivity, for example, of, uh, of circulating tumor DNA, there will be a background noise because we all accumulate driver mutations. It doesn't mean to say we will all go on to develop cancer. So how do you define what the background noise is going to be as opposed to when you believe a peak actually comes out? Or do you end up with the not problems we've got at the moment with prostate-specific antigen testing, where you'll get some signal, but you don't really know what that signal is? And therefore, how will you be able to use the liquid approach towards primary diagnosis is, a, is an issue. Where I see pri uh, liquid biopsy really working well is actually in prediction of recurrence, and therefore in defining the uh, individual. Because once you know the drive mutation, you know specifically what you're looking for, and current technologies are at the point of sen almost there at the point of sensitivity. So I do see in the next five years a greater application in the individual patient and a prediction potentially of the resistance that is going to be present in the recurrent tumor. So uh, yes, we will see that being uh, more and more applied. Um, how soon will depend on how the technology uh, is able to, to pick up, both in terms of sensitivity and specificity. Please. Listening to your talk, I sometimes saw a correlation between the way cancer is being thought of now and antimicrobial resistance yep. in terms of pre-existing mutations already being there. And therefore, I wonder whether further approaches would be in terms of the way AMR is being handled, that is targeting multiple targets at lower doses to try to weaken, in that case, the bacterium, but in this case, perhaps the cancer cell in terms of being obliterated from the well, I, I, here I have to recognize uh, C. Ayuku's press, prescience in having somebody from infectious diseases actually chairing the organization because it almost is precisely like that. Uh, the issue, though, is, and the big difference, is using lower doses of multiple medications will still kill the patient because we don't have the selectivity uh, that we do have in uh, trying to define antimicrobial resistance, and we're still using very toxic agents which are not specifically targeted at cancer cells. And therefore, the bystander effects, if you use 10 agents at lower dose, is still going to be very much greater. So I think it's like the AMR problem, but squared. Uh, it's actually that we don't have the specificity. As we develop that in a variety of ways, and I know this exciting work going on in India, looking at this, uh, looking at affinity and the capacity to develop better agents. That is something that, that, uh, that would be of importance. At the moment, we're kind of in the position of saying we can kill 99% of the cells, and we know some are going to come back. We can even predict which drugs you might be able to use. But it's also changing the patient mindset into the fact that when you go and see your oncologist and he says, well, there's a recurrence, that's not the end of the road and a move to palliative care. It's merely another stage in managing the process. And in HIV, we've seen that time and time again. And we've reached the point there where people can live as long uh, with HIV as they can in a normal lifespan. And for me, that would be success if the quality of life is good. So what role does uh, socioeconomic status and nutrition play in cancers? Like is there a difference between you know the prevalence and triggers in developing countries versus developed countries? Uh, yes, the, 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 they do play a, a very big part. 
the disease par excellence in cancer, which is associated with poverty and socioeconomic status, is cancer of the cervix. Um, that, that I can really vouch for, is you find that in the poorest communities of whatever society uh, you work in. When I was working in Africa, I knew exactly where to find uh, cases. It, it's the most strongly associated cancer, even when you control for smoking and a whole lot of other parameters uh, in this area. So we do see some linkage to deprivation. Uh, the other elements of re nutrition is really very difficult. Um, we have this association with obesity, um, but at the recent World Congress, we saw data coming from South America where being overweight actually protects against uh, premenopausal breast cancer, but postmenopausal breast cancer, it actually is acting as a risk factor. Um, recent reports about how obesity might be associated um, with cancer is, uh, a, I think, a little premature for the conclusions they're drawing. But nevertheless, understanding how uh, obesity is associated and why it's only associated with 13 cancers rather than the whole gamut is really going to be quite important uh, as to its causality. Undernutrition, not particularly associated, but you do have then the environmental factors like helicobacter and things in stomach um, and other conditions. So you've got to be aware that there are a very important slew of environmental factors that impact of which poverty and socioeconomic status and nutritional status will doubtless be, uh, be part and parcel of that. It has not been fully defined, and there's a lot of work to do to still try to uh, get to the bottom of it, and particularly to understand why. Okay. So thank you, Sir Boris, once again. Thank you. For your insightful talk and gracing the occasion.